Thank you, Rachel and Pam, for good song service. I want to ask you this morning, if you have your Bibles, to turn with me over to 1 Kings. 1 Kings, the 21st chapter. We'll be looking at the whole chapter, and we'll read those verses as we develop the message. 1 Kings, chapter 21, verses 1 through 29, and speaking on the subject, when God says, enough is enough. Let that <coughs> title grab you. When God says, enough is enough. The subject this morning is a, I guess I could say a very stressful subject to address. I want you to hear this and let it echo to you all through the message this morning. There is no limit to God's patience. There is no limit to God's patience. And if we are wise, we will listen to what the Word of God has to say. There is a tendency today of people, just like two of the subjects that I'm going to talk about in just a moment, that ignore the Word of God. They don't want to hear it. But we need to remember and listen to what God's Word has to say about our subject. Usually God will show us His compassion and shower us with His grace and His mercy. That's the way God usually acts with us. But when someone or a nation, and I want you to hear that, when some individual or a nation continually and deliberately makes rebellious choices, God is going to intervene. The Bible records an example of God saying, enough is enough, in Genesis chapter 19, verse 35, says God visited his wrath on the twin cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, raining fire and brimstone on them until nothing was left, not even a blade of grass was left. And if that were not heart-shattering enough, God echoes Enough is enough, and it echoes through the story of Elijah as well. And though it was not prompted by Elijah, but by who else? It was Ahab and his wife Jezebel. And what happens to them is certainly deserved, but it stands as a frightful reminder to us today. Ahab and Jezebel had no respect for anybody but themselves. And they had unrestrained desires and anyone who got into their way, anyone who crossed their paths were plowed under, as we'll find in just a moment in a law of uh, observing farmer named uh, Naboth found out when Ahab desired Naboth's vineyard. They didn't care. They had no thought what was Naboth's desire. Only theirs. The first thing I want you to see is Ahab desired Naboth's vineyard 
And he set his eyes upon this piece of land. It was a nice piece of land. And it was next door to uh, his palace in Samaria. But this, next, this land next to him was owned by Naboth, a simple man from Jezreel. And so Ahab, he approached Naboth as a potential buyer, saying in verse 2, in our text, in, in 1 Kings chapter 21, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it, or it seems good to thee. I will give thee the worth in money. What Ahab is saying to Naboth is, is whatever you want, I'll make it work in land or money. But he was not counting upon uh, Naboth's answer in 1 Kings chapter 20 and verse 3. Look at it. And Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid it, me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. Now, Naboth did not have any problem with Ahab personally, but he felt an obligation to the Lord and the Lord's work about his own, own family's inheritance. Leviticus chapter 25, verse 23, just listen. The land shall not ever be sold, for the land is mine. And this is what Naboth was remembering. He knew that God said that the inheritance of my father is not to be sold. That land belongs to me. Now, when you think about it, that story should have ended right there. But tragically, it does not. Naboth's unexpected answer cast a dark cloud over, the, over what had been a sunny day for Ahab. Look at verse 4 in 1 Kings 21, verse 4. And Ahab... Uh, uh, came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth, uh, the uh, Je Jezreelite, had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid down, notice this, and he laid down on, upon his bed and turned away his face and would not eat no bread. Like a spoiled brat uh, he, uh, who failed to get his own way, picks up his marbles, puts them in his pocket, and he goes home pouting every step of the way. And once he gets there, he throws himself down upon the bed, turns his face to the wall, and refuses to eat. And soon, he's got his wife Jezebel's attention. As she hears her husband's pitiful story, she says, Don't worry about it, Nebuchadnezzar. I will take care of this matter. And her domineering spirit rises at that time. And in verse 7 of 21st chapter 1 Kings, And Jezebel his wife said unto him, Dost thou not govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. Seizing the moment, uh, Jezebel concocts a story there of, of a witch's brew of bubbling curses to spew upon the unsuspecting Naboth. Naboth, uh, of all, and she did it all in the name of the king. Look at verses 8 through 10. Uh, that, so she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent the letters unto the elders and to the nobles that were in this city dwelling with Naboth. And she wrote in the letter saying, Proclaim a fast and set Naboth on high among the people and set two men, sons of Eliab, before him to bear witness against him, saying, Thou didst blaspheme God and the king, and then carry him out and stone him that he, that he, may, that he may die. Her strategy worked. But little does she know, think about this, little does she know that there is a meeting going on. Naboth is going to spill out over into her life. And then secondly, look at Jezebel's false claim we just read about there. 
And in response to what they presumed was a letter uh, from the king, the corrupt leaders of uh, Jezreel proclaimed a fast as, as Jezebel had asked them to in verses 11 through 13, part, first part of verse 13. And Naboth is summoned, and, and they sent him uh, 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 to head of the table uh, across from two despicable characters who were, who were prepared to defrain Naboth. That was their sole purpose of being there. And you can see how Jezebel worked. You can see uh, how evil that she is. She is taking here a man that loved God, a man who was law-abiding, a man who loved his family's inheritance, and she, this is because her little old stinking husband wanted that piece of property next to the palace. She says, I'll get it for you. And she concocts a lie saying that Naboth uh, said to blaspheme God and the king. And under the justice, guys are justice. They stand at the right time. And they point their fingers at Naboth and say, in verse 13, Naboth cursed God and the king. And there was a rumble in, in, that arises from the crowd. And, and immediately the magistrates, they, they uh, ordered Naboth's execution in verse 13, the last part of verse 13. Then they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones that he died. Cold-blooded, premeditated murder. All to satisfy the desire of this despicable couple, Ahab and Jezebel. Then thirdly, look at God's response in verses 14 to 15. Read it with me together. And there came in two men, children of Belial, and sat before him. And the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him uh, with stones that he died. And they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth is, is, stoned, is stoned and is dead. And it came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money, for Naboth is not alive, but he is dead. While Ahab and, and Jezebel were dancing with joy, there was another meeting, another response taking place in heaven, and God himself had been keeping up with this fiasco that they were doing, and he had it up and he had, had it up to here. God had said, Enough is enough. And who does he send to Ahab? That's right, he sent uh, Elijah. And we'll read verses 18 and 19 in just a moment. But if you listen about, think about verse uh, chapter 18, where Elijah on Mount Carmel, oh Ahab had already dealt with Elijah, and he knew that what Elijah said was going to happen, and that's the reason that God sent him there. He sent Elijah there to get away have the tension. Look at verses 18 and 19 of chapter 21. Arise, he, tell, he talks to Elijah and the Tishbite. Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he is gone down to possess it. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also take possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood even thine. Elijah finds Naboth where God said he would be. He was there relishing in the in thoughts uh, in the fields of, of Naboth, relishing the, the thought of fall vegetables. And can you just imagine the king's face uh, uh, when he saw that Elijah come and look at verse 20 of, of 1 Kings 21. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight uh, of the Lord. Oh, Ahab, I can only picture him. He must have been shaking in his sandals when he saw Elijah coming. For he knew, as I said a while ago, he knew that what Elijah was going to say, or what Elijah said it was going to happen. And later on, it did happen. 
Word for word, it happened. Just listen to 1 Kings 22, verse 35. And the battle increased that day, and the king was stayed up in his chair against the Syrians and died even, and the blood ran of, out of the wound into the midst of the chariot. In the unmistakable terms, God said, Enough is enough. Now, as I close, what have we learned in seeing how God did dealt with Ahab. And what have we learned that God will deal with us as well? There is an end to God's patience. And listen to me. There is no one that can tell you when it's going to come. If we continue to reject God's warning in His time, and in his way, he will bring destruction upon us. So how much better it will be for us to respond as Elijah did with each God-given assignment to hear God's voice warning to Ahab as Ahab did. Ahab ignored and Jezebel ignored God's warning time after time after time. And this truth serves as a serious warning to any one of us who refuses to acknowledge God's voice as God speaks to us. And I can tell you right now, there are many people today that hear the voice of God and they reject it, they do not respond to it, just exactly like uh, 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 Ahab did and Jezebel did. And I'm here to give you a warning today that God says enough is enough and he will deal with us the same way that he dealt with Ahab and Jezebel. Keep, God keeps his promises and no one can stop him. Though, you know, though God gave Ahab and Jezebel opportunity after opportunity uh, to repent, but they abused his mercy and patience and took it means that they could just endlessly get away with anything. And there's people today, beloved, that think they can get away with anything. They think just because they fool the pastor, they think because they fool the evangelist, it's because they fool uh, uh, the preachers that, but, that they'll fool God. But I'm here to tell you, you will not, shall not, cannot, and will not ever fool the Lord God. When God speaks to us, we need to listen. Listen. God is not slack in dealing with evil. He will not allow his patience to be abused. He will fulfill his promises. And no one can stop them. Right here is where I feel led by God to speak about the country that you and I are living in today. Beloved, if the pastors and the preachers of the gospel don't get some backbone about them and preach God's word just exactly like it is, our country is doomed to failure. You cannot continuously slap God in the face. When God says something is sin and the government backs it up, you cannot continuously uh, say, well, we'll live any way we want to and nothing can be done about it. Let me just tell you something, folks. Don't get me wrong. I love the gay people. Don't get me wrong. If you try to do anything to them, you'd have to fight through me. But I hate the sin that they're living in. And I say it's a sin because God's word says it's a sin. But you know what our government is doing? You know what our media is doing today? Tim Tebow, who says, I am a Christian, and the media uh, uh, said, keep it to yourself. Here's a young man that's not ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he takes a stand for God and teaches and preaches his word, and here comes Jason Collins along last week, and he says, I'm gay. And the media says, this man's a hero. Now, folks, there's something wrong with America. There's something wrong when your president of the United States of America calls a person like that and says, you have my backing 100%. What he ought to be doing is telling the man and the woman in the, in the, out of the word of God that this is what God says and God will forgive you of that sin. Preacher and I was talking last night.
If he wanted the same sex marriage, would he not put the same sex in the Garden of Eden? Amen. He would have. And besides that, God told man to go and multiply. And friend, I can tell you, a man can't multiply with a man. A woman can't multiply with a woman. Only a man and a woman can multiply. And that's where God who instituted marriage, he says marriage is between a man and a woman. And regardless of what our government says about it, it doesn't make any difference. God says it's wrong. Amen. Well, I've said enough. God says, enough is enough. I told you it was a difficult message, stressful message. Because I knew what God was going to say. I'd already heard it. The children of God, God is warning us. We need to take a stand. If we don't take a stand, then our country is going to go down. But let me tell you something. I'm not a prophet of doom. And I'm not a prophet. But let me tell you something. The Christian people can save America if we'll get up out of our pews and get out on the streets and teaching and preaching God's word and stand behind your pastors and your preachers and evangelists and say what he is saying is the word of God and we back him 100%. Now, I love you. And I hope I haven't made anybody mad. But if you get mad, you get mad at God, not me. Like I said, I love those people. If you try to harm them, I'll, do, I'll stand between you and them. But Don and I had this discussion not too long ago. If one of our children had come home, and told us that they were gay, we would tell them, you're still my child. I still love you. I don't love your lifestyle. But you're still welcome in my home because I love you. And we would take our, the word of God and we'd show them where God says that a man lies with a man and a woman lies with a woman is an abomination in the sight of God what God says. Turn over some time in Leviticus and you'll hear some more about it. So now don't you leave here today and say, well our preacher is just really against the gays. No sir, I'm not. Just telling you what their sin is. Just like I'll tell you what your sin is if it comes down to it. But God will save them. He will turn them around. Now they'll tell you, and they've told me this, it's a choice. It's a, and God made this way. God doesn't make people this way, folks. Why would God uh, make people uh, sin and send them to hell if they didn't repent? God doesn't make us sin. He, don't, he doesn't make them sin. Let's pray. Father, God, speak to us again. Let us leave this place, Lord, knowing what your word says. Father, you called me to preach 40 years ago. You told me to preach your word in season and out of season. Preach your word of every subject you lay up on my mind. And Lord, that's what I've tried to do. And Father God, we knew that it was not going to be easy today to preach this message. And Lord, I pray if there's an individual here today that's living a life like Ahab and Jezebel did, just thinking they can live any and every way they want to. I pray, Lord, that they have heard the message. Just because we Southern Baptists believe that uh, believe in eternal security, we do believe in eternal security, but that does not give us a license to go out and live any way we want to. And I pray, Lord, that people will hear that this morning. And, oh, God, do we pray for our country and our leaders. Lord, they're leading us down the path of destruction. And we know, Lord, that you're calling upon your children all across America today to take a stand. We know, Lord, we can save this country if we Christians, your children, will stand up and say, God says enough is enough. So, Father, speak to individuals in this place today and then give us the strength to go out.
and speak in the name of Jesus for our country. For it's in his name that I pray. Amen.